Hi everybody, I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, the founder of the nonprofit The Woman Behind the Smile and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something that through no fault of our own or through our own making, we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow. And while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. I have an incredible guest today, a friend of mine from several years, and when you listen to her story, you're going to say, she did what? And you're going to think to yourself that about things you've done, and you're going to go, I've done what? But my friend Christy Rutherford is here today. Are you there? Say hi. I hello. am. Hello, everyone. Hello. Christy's coming to us today, I believe, from South Carolina. Is that what you're hailing from today? Uh, no, I'm in the Bahamas. You're in the Bahamas? Yes. Even better. Well, <laughs> Christy's from all over the place, and she can tell us that story. But I, uh, I want to, I want to welcome her here today. She and I have known each other, like I said, for a few years. We've done interviews. We've collaborated on a book, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But she's got an extraordinary, extraordinary background, um, which you will just love to hear about. So let me give you her bio. A globally recognized leader, Christy Rutherford is an executive leadership coach that assists women with being promoted through office politics and self-care. A leadership development trainer and author, Christy published five number one best-selling books on Amazon in eight months. A Harvard Business School alumna, Christy is also a certified executive leadership coach from Georgetown University and has been featured in Forbes three times. She's the 13th African-American woman to achieve the rank of commander or lieutenant colonel equivalent for my Air Force and Army friends in the U.S. Coast Guards. Uh, she's responded to the needs of the citizens in, to, in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. She had a three-year congressional fellowship in the House of Representatives. She's got an MBA. She's got, a, I love this, she's a pastry chef, she's got a pastry chef diploma. She's done a lot of things. She's an incredible woman. And so when you hear her story, you're going to say, she did what? And why did she do that? And I want to say, Christy, you've been an amazing person. You've got, I mean, I watch what you've done, and I just go, wow, I'm so impressed. But there were days when you and I first met, and I'm thinking, who <laughs> the world is this woman? <laughs> so just to give our audience a little background, you and I, I think, first met out in Arizona, with Sharon Lecter. We'd gone out mm -hmm. to a program called The Dedicated Entrepreneur, where we were both kind of finding our way in business. We were, Blue had just died, and I was, had taken over his company, and I was going to, to uh, Sharon's to say, how do I learn how to make this a better business? And mm -hmm. I met a lot of people. I remember walking in, and, and I was pretty quiet. I, I get into a situation, and I look around, and I observe who's who. And there were some very bold, loud people in that group. You weren't one of them at the time. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. why am I here? What am I doing around all these people? Sharon was lovely. She's the best. And uh, then you and I started to talk. And I want you to tell everybody where you were in your life at that period of time. What was going on with you? In that period of time, so I was on. As, as I, don't, I think you mentioned it earlier, with three and a half years left to retire with a full pension. This so is your story. You've got to tell people. that story. Tell that story again. Okay. We, they don't know it. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I was the 13th African-American woman to make commander in the Coast Guard's history, but it, if, where my demographic was 0.1%. So if my demographic is 0.1% and I was only the 13th to make it in 225 years, there were some challenges. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> immense challenges 
And so I resigned, but three, three and a half years left to retire with a full pension. So I resigned in 2012. I would have retired in 2016. And I just couldn't take myself anymore. I couldn't take who life had made me anymore. I couldn't take the normalized hostile work environment. And really, I just resigned or I would have died within the year. And so that happened in 2012. So 2013, between 2012 and 2013, I was a busy, busy, busy entrepreneur trying to replace my income. And what I didn't anticipate in being an entrepreneur was, as you know now, entrepreneurship takes 120% brain capacity. And I was on zero. So there was no way I can get a business off the ground because I was exasperated from not managing my mental and my physical health. And so I ran out of money. I saved about six figures. And in a year, that was, go- that was gone. And so I now have no money. I moved in with my brother because I knew that I was not mentally and physically well. So even though I had been offered 20 jobs to so at that point, 26 figure jobs, I turned them all down. One, because I was psychologically unemployable. <laughs> I could not manage somebody telling me what to do. And two, because money and success wasn't what I was after. I I have more degrees than a thermometer. I have enough walls to decorate my, or I I have enough awards to hang on my wall, like ornaments, enough to decorate the Rockefeller Christmas tree. And so I had everything that they said I couldn't have, and I was miserable. So success and money and prestige and power and all these things, I wasn't chasing it anymore. I really needed my health. So moved in with my brother. I had no money. I was lost. And I thought I would still be rich in two months. And so we met, it was, was it 2015 or 2014? 15. Okay, so by 15, I had no money for two years. <laughs> I remember that part because you came into my hotel room and laid down on the couch and said, can I stay here? <laughs> hey, sure. I need to split this bill. Yeah, like, what's the bill? Like, I, I mean, I got everywhere on the skin of my chitty chin chin. And so I didn't have enough for a, a room by myself, I, but I could split a room. And I think what I pay you, like $45? I don't remember. Um, At that point, I was, yeah, it was... It was your story that paid for your room because I'm sitting there going, yeah. she did what? You know, as a former Air Force officer, I'm thinking, you gave up your pension three years before retirement? Are you, are you nuts? And then I heard the story. And, and it was so compelling. Because yeah, you went people, through things, people, you went through things that I never did. You know, I ne- yeah, I never had the bullying and, and the things that that you put up with as an officer. Kind of tell the audience exa- if you want to go that route. I'd like to hear what did you put up with while you were serving our country. Uh, you know, it, it's it's interesting because I ended up writing a book called Shackle to Success to, to talk about my challenges because I, nobody ever knew. My friends, most of my friends are white men. I was 0.1%. And they never knew. They never asked. <laughs> and, and they never listened, even if I was going to tell. So, you know, I was told at, at the entry source, you don't belong here. You're a woman. You're black. You'll never make it. Um, I, I remember the early memories on my first duty station. I was on a ship. Nobody would do what I asked them to do. And I'm nice. And 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 I would ask people to do things, and then when I became cray cray and started to threaten people, uh, that's when they started acting. Uh, one of my bosses harassed me to the point I, I almost had a nervous breakdown, and I ended up leaving a secure drawer um, open. And he was like, you know, Chrissy, you're such an unemotional person. I was just trying to get a rise out of you. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, and I was like, um, and so he harassed me and screamed in my face for months. And then I had another boss, you know, let's go a couple, uh, you know, another couple years. Um, one of my bosses, they wouldn't, they wouldn't pass my work up, uh, to the leaders. And these are new guys who came in. So I had already known the senior leaders and one of them would come and just stand in my face and scream at me in front of the people that I worked to be a respect for, for two years and just scream at me in my face while everybody in the office was like, what in the world is going on? And accused me of a- being AWOL because I went out to lunch. Um, I mean, so I, it was the, I think it was the slow bleed over time, Debbie, because it wasn't always acute pain. Does that make sense? So I'm yeah. just sitting in acid, slowly corroding because it, it would swing up where I would have great bosses. And then it would swing all the way down to where I had terrible bosses. And then it would swing up and then it would go down. 
And so, um, so yeah, it was, it was long-term. It was a normalized hostile work environment where I was always ready to fight. And I was 40, 40, I would say 40% of the uh, white men who passed me did not salute me. I'm a senior military officer. And they would just walk by me like, and they would be looking at me in my face. And, you know, in the military, I started screaming now, so I got to calm down. You, you bring it up. Yeah, breathe, breathe. Talk about breathe. It a long time. <laughs> but, you know, in the military, you're supposed to salute officers, and they would just, I, apparently, I was just the exception. They would just walk by me, look me in my face, and just keep on walking. And that would piss me off. I would, like, internally combust into a ball of fire like Jack-Jack on The Incredibles. And I wasn't, I couldn't scream at them because that's not, so now I would get in trouble. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so it was, it was a lot. I mean, it was a lot. And so I think it, when you leave, uh, I, I do that work because I'm seeing it. One, I see it happen with lawyers and doctors and other people. Um, so that not managing that and not managing my stress and always taking the hard jobs and being a workaholic and, and not taking care of my health and working to prove people wrong, that over time, just created a situation that I just had to escape. And and really, I could not remain in the job with who I was and uh, and be healthy. I hated myself and I, I hated my life. And, but I had all these things. And, you know, to be a senior military officer, there's so much respect and prestige there. So it was an illusion of success. But really, I was miserable and I was dying. Did you have anybody to talk to or who could you go to? Because... I can just feel the stress building up. But we were all in the same boat. Yeah, <laughs> Does that make sense? True. So this became this was a normalized dysfunction where we're all, you know, me and my friends were talking over happy hour, you know, hundreds of dollars of bills, uh, you know, drinking and eating fried empanadas and just talking about how much our lives suck. And that became our story. So we, we talked to each other about this, or I talked to my mentors about this, but it wasn't the, the, it was never the story of you don't have to put up with this. And I remember when I was leaving and I made the decision to resign, which was, I mean, it, it was hard. It, I didn't walk away and step on a magic carpet and leave my job, <laughs> you know, and leave my great career that I, uh, that I built uh, along with, you know, uh, my mentors. But when I made the decision to leave, I, my mentees were crying. My, my mentors were crying too. So it was so crazy. And, uh, and they said, well, Christy, who's going to teach us how to fight? You know, we, we need you in the battle. And I was thinking, you know, my people fought these battles in the civil rights era. You know, my grandfather died fighting for, you know, to be respected. And he was chased to be lynched in the early 1900s. And this is like, why do I have to do this in the 2000s? This is crazy. I quit. So it, it's, it's, it was normal for us to fight. It was normal for us to, to be disrespected. It was normal for all these things to happen, but that was not normal. So when you walked away, what did your friends and family say to you? Did anybody talk um, to you? Oh, they, they talked about, they talked about me. Um, uh, they, some of my quote unquote friends called me stupid, uh, mm-hmm. She'll be back. She's crazy. You know, why did this happen? And my family was disappointed because when sometimes when family attaches their identity to your success, because I was, you know, a successful person in my family. So they would say, Chrissy's in the service, even if they don't know what that means, Debbie. I <laughs> understand. From a small town in South Carolina. So I'm the point of story for my family to be proud of. But now that that uh, image is going away, who is she now? You know, who can we, what is Christy now? Because especially when I moved in with my brother, I became a loser in in some regard because now I'm broke. So we can't hold her as a trophy to say that we've made it if she's a nobody right now. So it it was hard. I mean, I didn't go home for, you know, a good six months because nobody understood. But my suffering had been silent for so long that... Or it was loud for so long, however you want to put it, nobody understood. And and I really got to the sense, Debbie, that I didn't understand why I had so much conflict when I made a decision to save myself. And everybody made it about them. And it wasn't about them. What about me? (laughs) 
you know, as I'm leaving, they were like, well, what are we going to do when you leave? And I'm like, but what about me? Well, but what is the service going to do when you leave? But I'm dying. What about me? So, so many times people attach their destiny to you that they don't know who they are without you. And, and we get caught up as women, you know, a lot of times and leaders suffering for the point of others. And I had to make a decision where I had to make myself a priority or I was going to die. I, I'm sitting here, just I can visualize that. I, I, I've heard it so many times, and it's true. You just want to take care of others, and you do it to the detriment of yourself. Mm-hmm. And I, have, I, was put, I would put myself in your parents' position, too. I get that. You know, We do wear our children's success as badges of honor. And when something gets messed up, you know, you hide or like you don't talk about the 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 one that's not doing, you know, what everybody expected. <laughs> and yeah. you know, it was, it was a real eye opener for me at one point when one of my kids said, "Mom, you know, I respect what everybody else is doing, but that wasn't me. That wasn't my life." Yeah. And then I'm yeah. like, "Well, why didn't you say something about it? You know, why didn't you speak up? Same like you. Why didn't you speak up and tell everybody, I'm not happy? You know, yours was so drastic mm-hmm. at 17 years just to up and go from the outside or from an outside point of view. I'm thinking, or oh, my gosh, yeah. what'd she do? You know, but putting ourselves in your position, which I love now that you're talking about it, because women don't talk about that kind of stuff. You know, I'm yeah. sure the men are sitting there too going, oh, my gosh, did we do that? Or maybe they're not. But the women are probably saying, yeah, that's happening to me. Thank you for speaking up. And that's why we're doing the show, Christy, because it's stand up and speak up and let people know what your story is so that the person sitting beside you who may be going through the same thing doesn't have to feel alone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when you, you've done a lot of, a lot of speaking. What's the, what's the um, how do people feel when they come up to you? What are they saying to you? And is there a difference between what the men say and what the women say? I think that um, a lot of women get it. And and men say, man, I felt like you were talking to me too. Christy, I know I was in a room with all these women. <laughs> mm. But I think you were talking to me too. But it's really, leader, um, Debbie, what leaders do and what the servant leaders do. And men do it too. I don't know if they go to the 10th degree because women, of course, we do everything two and three times more. Um, <laughs> right. We just go further in. Um, but, but the men get it too. And so what I think about when we met, I was so broken and I was so ashamed and I was so embarrassed that I broke out. I mean, that I, that I burned out and I didn't talk for the first two days because I was so ashamed of what happened. The great Christy Rutherford burned out and lost all her marbles and I think what we both needed in that moment was just somebody to talk to. And and so we talked, I think for a couple of hours that night and, um, and really to, cause you didn't understand the story, but we just needed, I think comfort in that moment, Mm -hmm. but, and, and to let, uh, I think other strong, another strong woman to see another strong woman in pain and not judge us for it. So whenever I do speak, it's, and I tell my story transparently now because I'm over it. And, and now the, the story is really in an effort to get women to see that they are along the same path and to stop them before they derail themselves. So there is connection there. And they say, oh, my God, Christy, your story resonates with me so much. So high achieving women, we have a lot of the same common challenges, but we also have a lot of the same silent sufferings. And, and how can I make a decision to take care of myself when my family is going to be embarrassed? And how can I make a decision to say no and actually make myself a priority when I have created a situation where I needed to be needed so much that I have, I'm feeding 70 people, but I'm only being fed by two. It's true. And as you get out there, are you seeing a difference in, say, the millennials and the way they're looking at life versus the boomers and, you know, all of us in between? You're a little bit younger than I am. But are the younger women feeling like what we did? 
are they stepping up and they standing up or are they walking away? I, I, there's, I feel there's a difference in, in the attitude of, of working and doing in that between them and, and us, although we're all women. I just feel like there might be a little bit, they might be stronger than we are in speaking up. What do you think? Oh, well, it, it depends. They have the same challenges too, and some of them do stay, or they don't know how to manage the, the, the household or the priority. So do I see a difference in the millennials? No, not really. And I've talked to a lot okay. of them, and mm-hmm. they, they're falling in the same holes. I do think their awareness is different, though, Debbie. So some of them are aware that they are doing some of the wrong things. And if they chose to change in that moment, then, then they can be different. So I think they seek help. And I, I remember reading an article where it says millennials are accustomed to being coached because organized sports became a thing when they were growing up. So they're, so they're accustomed to being coached and nurtured from other people. So they are able to seek um, guidance from other people Some, sometimes when they was talk to each other i'm like okay well, that's great but <laughs> you know you need to learn from somebody that's more seasoned so some of the women can see some of the things that they're doing wrong and they choose to take action but they some of them have the exact same challenges that we do i think they're more willing to speak about it like you and i yeah. would not talk you know mental health back then we you didn't talk about it, especially as officers, because you didn't want that in your record. You didn't want anybody oh, to know no. that there was a crack Ooh. in there, because that would be Never. the end of your, yeah, you wouldn't get promoted. Um, Never. And so you hid that, right? You just, you absorbed all that yeah. inside, which I always said, if we're going to die, we're going to die of ulcers, not of anything else, because we're, we're yeah. hiding stuff. Um, but when you started to speak up, now, your personality was different than mine. I, you could challenge them um, which probably was to your detriment at some point when you spoke up because oh, I was aggressive. Oh yeah. I was you were aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> Which is probably good when you're working, but not good when you're trying to get promoted or, you know, and it's interesting because I, a, a lot of your personality was what my late husband, what Lou was like, you know, a brilliant guy, but he could push the buttons of the guys that the next rank up, the generals loved him, but the guys in the middle, uh-huh felt the competition and and they didn't like being challenged by someone of lower rank because <laughs> even though if they yeah. knew they were yeah. wrong it's like you I see I see Lou and you in the same area where, where when he left the military you know it was a big challenge for us too but he 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 got to the rank of he was coming up for lieutenant colonel but when he left he went through the same thing you're doing what why are you leaving mm-hmm. you only got eight years ago or six years to go whatever but his his personality was not do as I say. It was more like do as I do, you know? Yeah. His goal was yeah. to make as much money in six years as an entrepreneur as he would have made through his retirement. And he, mm-hmm. he was doing that when he passed away. But, you mm-hmm. know, he didn't get rid of the stress in his life. Um, and he didn't take care of his health, which is what I love about mm-hmm. you, how when you did it, you did this because you wanted to take care of you and your mental health, your physical health. And could you tell the audience, how did you, how did you take that jump and start doing things for yourself physically, mentally, especially when you were broke? What did you do to, to exercise or to, you know, put yourself around a dedicated entrepreneur because it wasn't inexpensive. Oh no, I, I, I had an investor in my business. I almost sold my soul to come there, but, um, when I left the, the Coast Guard, I had 17 medical conditions, and mm-hmm. I, was, I was broken, and I had arthritis and headaches and backaches and, uh, you know, mental strain in my ears were ringing and blinding headaches and all these things. So I didn't stop voluntarily, Debbie, mm-hmm. right? There's a quote that says, people either change through inspiration or desperation. I changed through desperation. I was hard-headed. And so when I was in my brother's house and, and now I have no money, like no money. I sold my car. I couldn't run anymore. So I was self isolated for three and a half years and I was running from the skeletons in my closet. I was running from all the boxes in my closet because one of the things that successful women are good at, we're good at compartmentalizing stuff. We don't, we don't, manage stuff in the moment because we're busy seeking the next goal. So we'll put it in a box 
and you know, one day I'm going to come back and I'm going to take that box off the shelf and I'm going to unpack that problem. So we're always goal oriented, searching for the next thing. And so at a certain point, I opened that closet and all the boxes fell on top of me. And so I had to, I couldn't run from myself anymore and I couldn't run from the responsibility because I'm broke. I have no money. I'm in my brother's house. I have no car. And I now have to, what do we say? The chickens have come to roost. So Mm -hmm. either I'm going to unpack this stuff or I'm going to be stuck, broke and miserable in this house forever. So a part of (laughs) my decision to take care of myself was that was the only way I was going to be able to get back up. And so I stopped asking, what do I need to do? And I started asking, who do I need to become? So, you know, starting to walk and then meditate and exercise and eat. I, I wouldn't, when I didn't have any money, I wasn't necessarily eating healthy because I, mm. I could afford a little pieces of pizza. But, um, but the desire, I think, to, it wasn't necessarily, Debbie, really about the physical stuff as much as it was the internal stuff. I had so much internal chaos going on. So forgiveness and actually leaving, when I left the Coast Guard, I was a 12 tight uh, in my pants. And four months after leaving, by that August, I was a size eight. Yeah. So just being in that environment where the, the, the normalized talks to work environment there, I felt like battery acid was running through my system and was corroding my soul and like my physical body. So that stress created disease because I was that disease. And so having the time to just stop, I think I slept for the first year that I was in my brother's house because I didn't know how tired I was because I never stopped. Hmm. And so even if I was I didn't know that I was depressed until I wasn't depressed anymore. Does that make sense? Because my depression didn't look like other people's depression. I was still working. I was still working 16 hours a day. And when I wasn't depressed anymore, I was like, is that what depression was? Because I worked through mine. I wasn't laying in the bed, you know, immobilized, which is what sometimes we see in images. Yeah. But, um, but the self-care was important. So working out and really it wasn't, again, it wasn't the external stuff. It was the internal stuff. It was forgiving people. It was doing the work to, to uh, release the internal clutter. It was going back to those childhood experiences because my battles before I joined the Coast Guard, I was already fighting proof people to prove them wrong. You know, fighting against teachers in a small town that told me that I would never be anybody. Fighting against you know, principles that suspended me from my big personality because Christy talks too much and she talks loud. Fighting, you know, when I was one of the first people in my family to go to college and one of, you know, the very few people from my my hometown to go to college. So fighting against, you know, people who secretly wanted me to fail and thought that I would come back home and work beside them making socks. Fighting against the people in college who, you know, so I was already a fighter long before I joined the military. So the military just became... Uh, a running script of a battle that I had already been engaged in. So that was really the cycle that happened, Debbie, was I was always so caught up in working hard and fighting to prove people wrong that I was doing things, or I would say, you know, in a career path that I love, by the way, but it wasn't necessarily who I was meant to be. I was just had my head down fighting to prove you wrong, that I lost the vision of what I really wanted my, wanted in my life. So even though I had it all, quote unquote, I had, I didn't have anything because it wasn't really what I wanted. Well, and I saw you, I was watching thing you said, and I love this, that you had to shift from success to significance. Mm-hmm. And that you had to rise above the criticism, which was the I told you so's, with unshakable yep. self-confidence. And that mm-hmm. getting that self-confidence back is a process. It, it doesn't happen overnight, right? Didn't for me. When I gave away a million dollars, I didn't have any self-confidence for a while. And it took, took oh. some time to start speaking about it. So what gave you the courage to stand up and speak about what happened because you do that now for executive women all over the place. Mm-hmm. Well, what's interesting is I remember, you know, when we were at Sharon's event, that was a that was a turning point for me because, you know, for the first two days I didn't talk. And what I learned was even though I didn't talk, people could still see my presence. Does that make sense? 
So even if I felt like a loser in that moment, because I had no, I mean, I think I had like $150, um, but it was an expensive conference. And I just, I was so ashamed, but people can still see that you're somebody, even if you don't talk. And I remember just, again, being ashamed. And so then one of the participants, Lisa, had a book, Fit to Fab. Mm -hmm. And she talked about um, she was sexually assaulted. She cut herself. She was bulimic and all these things. And she wrote a book and she had success. And then there was another lady that was there um, who was gang raped. And she talked about that and she had a book and her PR agent was there and she had success. And so here I am sitting there listening to women and their challenges. And then it hit me, Debbie. I said, okay, so what's your deep, dark secret again, Christy? <laughs> Which one? Right. Uh, you burned out and these women have been sexually assaulted and they're free. So it, it, it hit me in the head like you're, there's always something worse that could happen to you. Does that make sense? Oh, and, yeah. And when you choose to get over yourself and heal from how you're seeing yourself in this moment, then you too will be able to share your story because they have followings. And they're not like I, Lisa had this following and people who paid to come to her conference. And I'm like, people got problems like that. Cause that's not my, that's not my niche. Does that like, those aren't my experiences. So when you think about a tribe, people have distinct challenges that they need. So I'm not here to serve, to serve the multitude. I'm here to serve the women who, ha, who are walking the same path that I've walked, who've done the same things that I've done because I can set them free fast because I've been there. So that was really a point of contention of, Chris, you need to get over yourself and heal and let the story go. And then whenever you're ready, share it. And, and the following year is when I started writing uh, my book. So it was 2016 when I wrote my first book and then the second book and then the third, fourth, and fifth one. So that was a real turning point for me to see women who were serving in significance, who chose to do the work and heal themselves and now come back and, and say without shame that these are the things they went through. And so when people read my LinkedIn post, some people say, Christy, you know, I applaud you because you're very transparent. And I'm like, yeah, but that's, it's not about me. It's not about Christy anymore. So I can't be embarrassed about my story because I'm here to serve women at this level. Same thing with you know, the women who got on the stage and told their stories. And mm -hmm. so we're, we're, we're now walking a similar path. I, I totally agree with that. And it was, it's very cathartic to get the story out. And I think once, like in, in my case, when the story was written, it wasn't me. And you said that at one point, um, who you are is not where you are. Mm -hmm. And where we were was at the bottom at one point, no, bottom, bottom, <laughs> bottom, bottom. And that's when you're going through the shame game. And, you know, the worst person mm -hmm. you're going to forgive is yourself. Um, but getting that off and separating the story from who you truly are. Yeah, is a, it's a turning point. And tell everybody how, how you got so ramped up and did so many books so quickly. That to me, that was amazing because I was part of one of them. Uh, how, how did you do that? What was the process for that? Well, I, I was trying to broker a deal with the man above. So by 2016, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was still in my brother's house. I was trying to get out, right? And so my first book was called Shackle to Success. But really what I wanted to write was my, my second book was called Heal Your Brokenness because I was healed and, you know, I had a couple of I had a couple of challenges where I didn't react and respond in my old way. And I, that was my real fear, Debbie, was have I really been healed or am, am I, uh, is, this a, is the healing? Yeah. And, and the peace an illusion because I was super aggressive and I was, I was, you know, a powerful woman that my soul was corrupted and, and am I, can I now be trusted? Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. if you say I was a military officer, that doesn't really mean any, it, it means something to military people because we understand it, but the military just allowed me to thrive in a bad habit, which was aggression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if, if I'm on a stage and you say something to me, I would black out on you. I would black out. And so can I now be trusted with being a leader in a different realm because is that lady going to show up again? 
And so it took a couple of, of tests to happen to test to see whether or not I was authentic. And again, this is like, a, you know, the universe is testing me. And so I was good. And so I said, okay, well, let me write this book. And so I wanted to write Heal Your Brokenness. And, and God was like, um, Christy, you're so happy right now. You never talked about how you became broken. So people aren't going to believe you. Like, do, do you have credibility to talk about healing your brokenness if you never revealed that you, one, you were broken, and two, how you became broken? So I ended up telling the story of my career in the first book, and then I wrote the second book, and then by November, so that was April and I think June, and then by November, and I, I had been accepted in Harvard Business School that July, and still, my mom paid the, 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 the GI Bill for, paid for part of it, but my mom ended up like making up the other part. So here I am still being, um, looking at where I was, Debbie, because I still didn't have any money, but the world was acknowledging who I was because scrubs don't get into Harvard Business School. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, and November, you know, I, I wrote my other two, and then the following year I was doing all these, um, these interviews, and really I learned more from y'all in these interviews than they didn't make any money, but I was learning and I was growing. And then the following year I transcribed one in the Manifest Your Dreams, which is one that uh, – well, that we're co-authors in, and that's one of my favorite books. Yeah, and I found that the books aren't necessarily the money makers, but they give you the credibility and and they they let people know who you are. I think the books were really for me just just to get my story out. When so when Shackleton Success first came out, Shackleton Success is really was my career, and I you know the challenges and I talked about it and. I had nightmares for two months because I now had to relive the experiences. And I ate uh, a couple of gallons of ice cream. I think I gained like 10 pounds. So I think about how Maya Angelou, when she wrote, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, she was friends with Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and she had some challenges. And so what Maya Angelou would do, or Dr. Maya Angelou would do, she would rent out a hotel room. And so she would go into the room, and uh and and lay on the bed and come into the space and then she would you know work for 10 12 hours she would write and then she would leave that energy there and then she would go back home so she wrote i know why the cage bird sings using a hotel room well i didn't understand that at the time so i was stuck with my skeletons does that make sense she would Mm -hmm. open the door (laughs) tell the story and then she would close that door and then go home and have rest. I didn't have rest. So I'm fighting lions, tigers, and bears in my sleep again because I'm reliving the story. And so, um, but before I published that book, I wanted to throw up three times because this is the first time that I'm being vulnerable and sharing that I didn't have it all together and, and, and really letting people see what was behind the, the curtain of Oz, the great Christy Rutherford had challenges. What? <laughs> Never. The great Christy Rutherford had this? Never. And so wanted to keep that illusion of perfection and uh, the, power I and get prestige it. was no longer serving me. Yeah, yeah. I get it. And, and, yeah. But it's in our own minds, you know? Yes, it's all in your mind. It's in our own minds, and I'm, I'm reading one of the topics here. It says, how can you live authentically and unapologetically? It takes real courage yeah. to step out and say, you know what? The great Christy Rutherford, the great Debbie Montgomery Johnson, the great whoever, we're great in our yeah. own minds or we're great in our mom's minds, which I love my mother. Yeah, um, right, right. Yeah. Which, but we don't want to disappoint either. And so mm-hmm. to open mm-hmm. up and show that we have a crack could be disappointing to some people. Did you lose any friends it, over it, that? It was. I lost a lot of um, mentees who were, who were devastated. I, I lost a lot mm-hmm. of mentees who were devastated that their superhero was human. Mm. And I remember one of them saying, because, you know, after I, after I did that and I didn't die of shame, like I thought I would die of shame after I published <laughs> that book, and I, and I clicked publish, and... Uh, and then I waited to die of shame. And so about three days later, 
women started to inbox me. Uh, some of the women from my career, but a lot of powerful women that I respected started to inbox me. They were like, Christy, oh my God, I'm experiencing the exact same thing. <laughs> and so I was like, Oh, okay. So you liked it. <laughs> you know, so, um, so I'm not going to die. So that I think in a part healed, but I, you know, I remember when I shared a lot of people stopped talking to me. Uh, a lot of, uh, some of my mentees were disappointed. And one of them are, uh, on Facebook was like, why don't you just stop reminiscing and just remember who you are? And I was thinking she revered me so much but she was, one, one of the things, Debbie, was I was able to save my mentees from what I couldn't save myself from. So mm-hmm. they didn't have the same experiences. So if, if, if I fought the lions, tigers, and bears, I created the, the yellow brick road and said, get on the yellow brick road and follow me. Right. They, they, did, they had no idea I was bleeding and, you know, walking with a tourniquet and all these other kind of things. So they didn't have the same experiences. So here I am, the person that, that, they're, that they're following now saying, hey, I, I'm human and I'm broken. They were like, wait, what? But they never had those exact same experiences because I taught them how to not. Does that make sense? You, so you protected them. Yes. You, you put them in that bubbled room, you know, that they didn't have to go through what you did, which is really, that's what mothers do. That what, that's what sisters yep. do. That's what we all try to do. But that's not reality. That's like, you, you know, you're talking about the kids that are growing up on, on sports teams now that everybody gets a trophy. Well, yeah, I don't want to get into that subject, but, you know, <laughs> life's not about getting a trophy, everybody. It's about going through the yeah. experiences. So how can people get a hold of you? How can they get those books, your books? My books are on Amazon, all of them. And okay. so I do have a new book that's coming out. It's so good. Uh, it's, it's the greatest book ever, Debbie. It's called Trauma Default. So uh, the, it's, if you go to traumadefault.com, you can pre-order the book. It'll be out in the next few weeks. But all the, the rest of my books are on Amazon. And you can reach me at christyrutherford.com. You can check out my website. I do coaching, speaking. Um, really, my, my goal, I'm a healer. Like People say, Christy, what do you do? And, uh, I'm a healer. I'm not an executive coach per se as much as I'm a coach for executive women who need to heal and who need to be whole in our success because we don't we're not allowed in our own minds again we're not allowed to express how miserable we are with our success we're not allowed to feel broken in our success when we have everything that people want and really it's an illusion and a barrier that we're creating in our own life that's simply not true so christyrutherford.com you can email me at info at christyrutherford.com but um but yeah, I, I would really get Trauma Default. It's so good. It's Trauma Default, get a clear vision of your future by breaking your trauma default of your past. And so I talk about really my challenges started long before I ended my job. I was, my trauma default was I was accustomed to proving you wrong. If you said I could do something, I would prove you wrong. So the, the job was just a continuation of that same script of me working hard to prove you wrong. And so that's what really created my burnout. I don't have any ill will or, or negativity uh, of anybody because it, all, all of the stories are a part of my journey. And I don't have to wish ill will on people because I know that karma is going to come back and get them. But I appreciate them because I wouldn't be who I am. This is a part of my purpose and my passion. The same thing with you and your story. Without all of it, you wouldn't be able to inspire people in the way that you do right now. So I'm grateful for the journey. And, uh, and, and this is just a different chapter in it. Well, I, I'm listening to your story, Ben, and, and li- I'm excited about the book, too, because um, I, I was thinking about, about when my kids were talking to me about online dating, and it was the mom don't, mom don't, mom don't. And I was mm-hmm. thinking, hey, I'm the adult here. Let me do what I want, something just like you. <laughs> don't prove me wrong. Let me do my own thing. You know, let me show you that I yeah, can do this. Yeah. And then, oops, you know, well, I shouldn't have done that. But, like you said, the things that have happened to us in the past have become, that's part of our quilt of life, as I, as I put it. It's part of us. Yep. And without the good, the bad, and the ugly, we wouldn't be who we are. And I love your enthusiasm, your energy, and your, your, your fight. And I love how you've learned how to calm it down a little bit, too, so that you don't scare people off that really need to hear your story. Because you could scare them off. You could well, scare you know, me I, off. 
But you're a great, you're but a great I gal. would still, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I think about having peace and, and being stable in my energy, I wasn't, I was still in, I was so hurt. And so I was defensive mm-hmm. and, and I, I used to be super aggressive. So until I developed, until I fully healed and just owned my power, Debbie. So that's the thing. And, and I work with a lot of powerful women. We're not allowed to, or, or we just don't know how to regulate our power because if I'm a thousand watt light bulb, I could be a thousand watts in my power and I could shine light at people right now, or I could be a thousand watt lightning bolt and come and freaking strike you and burn you down to the ground. So once I think a part of always trying to acquiesce our energy to fit into rooms or apologize for our power and our strength or try to turn down my light so other people won't be intimidated. Once I was able to just say, hey, this is who I am. I'm straight lace. I'm raw and uncut. And I just bring it to you across your forehead, you know, in a very direct style. But I do it because I care. And and I just own my power. I was, I'm able to relax in it. And so I don't have to calibrate my my strength and then become passive aggressive because I have to turn it down to suit energy in the room. So that was, I think I was learning, you know, at that time when we met, I was so just off. And even over the, the, the next few years, it was, you know, am I too much? Am I too little? Am I too much? Too little. Mm-hmm. And now I just own it. And so there is a, there is power and serenity. So one of the, the, um, I, I told this lady a couple months ago, I said, when you own your power, people will respect you in your power. When your power and your your presence will raise the energy level. When I was watching some yep. of your your um, your talks, you bring the energy up to you. And if yep. they if that's scary to people, then they can back off and go their own way. You know, but it's all about exactly. don't change who you are because of what you think other yep. people are going to think. And I I but love the energy that you have. Women. Yep. Yep. I mean, you know, we, we get in trouble in school for that, Debbie. <laughs> we do. Yeah. We're told to be quiet. Nope. Yeah. And then, and then when you go to work, you know, sit over there in that corner. And that's a, that's again, a, you know, a challenge that a lot of strong and powerful women have is we're so uh, twisted now in our energy and then we're passive aggressive. So I was talking to this lady the other day and she was like, well, what did I say in this conversation to, you know, you call me passive aggressive. And, you know, what did I do in this conversation to make you call me passive aggressive? I said, one, you, you're a queen in your job and you, you're, you're a misfit in your job because you applied for a, a lower job than you deserved and desired. And now you're working amongst people who are tearing you down. And uh, so you don't belong there. I know you're passive aggressive. You're a powerful woman. <laughs> I said, have you been accused of being passive aggressive? She said, yeah, five times. I said, exactly. So don't be badgering me on this phone. Like, so that's a challenge that we have. And it's, if we own, if we, if we get the clarity to be able to own our, our power, uh, people can't relax in our power if it's unstable. That's true. That's true. But there is a fine line. We don't want to overpower because we do want people to feel comfortable around us, but when they realize that you're coming from a position of love and encouragement and support, that's the difference. Because they, especially after you've been so vulnerable in, in your story, they mm-hmm. get that mm-hmm. you know that you you are human, and we all are human. And sometimes it's the rise above, and and as you rise above, and as you come through your story with this power and owning your story, as I try to do, I mean, I I find when I start speaking about my story, this inner power just comes out from who knows where. Yeah. It's that purpose your that comes being. out. Your spirit to being. Mm-hmm. You, that's your purpose, and that's why it's coming out, and that's where we get the credibility and the um, the buy-in because people mm-hmm. see how passionate it has become it is it's become our lives in many ways and it's not about us anymore this is not about us this conversation is not about christy rutherford and it's not about debbie montgomery johnson it is about who is listening to this that that could possibly rise up themselves and get over their past and look to the look to their future and that's the coolest thing Yep. And I think, you know, I love, you know, I think I interviewed you like four or five times. <laughs> We've had fun, yeah. Stop. 
Sisters by other sisters, sisters, my friend. From Debbie, yes. I was like, you did what? Uh, you know, and then, oh, my God, you did what? And so I love to see your journey. And, you know, now that you've been on CBS and CNN and MSNBC and all these, you know, these shows and around Valentine's Day. And so to watch you unleash into who you are right now. And so I guess we're just having joy watching each other. And, um, and, and, we have it. and it, it, our, came, it came from Sharon's living room. I remember, yeah. remember I was standing behind the pole in her living room going, someday we're going to have the woman behind the smile. Someday we're going to have, you know, you did what? Um, and oh, trauma it. default. Who, who would have figured five mm-hmm. years ago that trauma default was going to be coming out? So I thank you so much for telling your story. You know I could talk for hours now. I do want to get yeah, Dr. Tim to come in. I, I, I want Dr. Tim to come in for just a minute <laughs> if he's there. Uh, he needs to unmute himself, but Tim is a former Navy officer, so he gets the military part of our conversation. Excuse me, but I worked for a living. I was in the All right, I'm man. sorry. Tim was in the Navy as a productive. In the Navy. In the Navy, productive person. <laughs> anyway. So, Tim, what, what do you find from this conversation? What struck okay. you about this conversation? So... Um, what I take from this is in listening to it from the perspective of somebody who assists large quantities of, of traumatized scam victims, much of what you're talking about in terms of your own burnout and your own experience and your progression through recovery from that process actually mirrors the experience of the people that Debbie and I deal with on a constant basis. We reach over a million victims a year, and they're all been through a process of extreme demoralization, manipulation, um, and, and the trauma that goes with that. And I think one of the things that would be maybe helpful instead of me um, talking would be maybe you can address for a few minutes Talk to women who have been put in this position, similar to Debbie in in her early years. Of course, she's been um, through this process thoroughly at this point. But but to victims who are still in the early stages, that are still trying to find their feet and find their voice and figure out what it all means and how they get through that depression, etc. Maybe you can talk to them for just a few moments. Chris, you go ahead. And by the way, uh, Chris, I, thank, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your service, Dr. Tim. I think one of the, when you understand that you need all of it, Oprah says true forgiveness is knowing that the past couldn't be any different. And we can spend our lives in shoulda, woulda, coulda. And if I would have known better, but we can't change that. I can't change the coffee that I drank this morning and it was delicious. (laughs) So one, one thing that, that got me through the, the, the hardest times was I put a, a, a wrote today on a eight by 10 sheet of paper with a Sharpie and I hung it on the first wall that I looked at when I woke up in the morning. And so when I wake up in, when I woke up in the morning, I would look at that sheet of paper and I say, okay, Today, my tomorrow is going to be built on what I created today. I can't change what happened yesterday, but today is a fresh day. And so it allowed me to wake up with a renewed sense of what, I, what am I going to create today? Like, that's all I have. Like, that's, that's what I have in this moment. And then right before I went to bed at night, I would look at it again and say, okay, well, I didn't get everything that I wanted done. And yes, I still failed. And yes, I'm still broke. But tomorrow is a new day and I get a clean sheet. So if, if understanding that you're going to get to a point where you're going to appreciate your challenges, like, like Debbie and I on the other side, my Angela said, on the other side of every storm is the greatest sense of joy. And I remember hearing that when I was in my career burning out and, and, and I recorded it on my phone and I just, I played it all the time on the other side of every storm is the greatest sense of joy. Well, I, I, I'm in a hurricane, tornado earthquake all at the same time. And I think I'm going to die. And I didn't know what it meant in that moment, but I believed it. This is the other side of our storm. And if you can 
work on yourself and healing. And the, the challenge that I was having when I was chasing the money was I wasn't working to heal. And it, it wasn't until I stopped and got present and started to heal my past and my childhood stuff and my work stuff and started to forgive them that my life changed. So who do you need to forgive in this moment? What part, some, some part, and this is what I wrote in Trauma Default, de- depression is destiny suppression. So there is somebody in you that wants to come out. Like Debbie said, every time I get on stage to tell my story, I illuminate and there's somebody, you know, that, that comes and starts to talk. What part of your spiritual being wants to be awakened through this trauma and through this pain to now heal, to now be able to serve whoever you're meant to serve. Maybe you're just meant to serve the people in your community. Maybe it'll be local, maybe it'll be national or state or international, but your healing is going to assist other people if you choose and just have the courage. So don't do it for yourself. Do it for the people that are are meant to, um, to heal through your healing. That's a perfect wrap up. That, that I'm, you know, I'm at a stupor of thought because that is just perfect <laughs> for what we're doing. Is that it's that stand up and speak up and it, get it out and heal from the inside out so that you can help others and move forward. So Christy, and mm-hmm. uh, thank you so very much for being my guest today, Dr. Tim from the from the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scam or Scars. Thank you so much for being here again, and and Always just. Welcome encouraging you know the folks that are here to to really embrace what's happened in their life and Mm -hmm. forgive first forgive yourself first and then be able to move forward so you can help others so christy thank you and folks again can can get you uh give your website again one last time christy christy rutherford.com and go to traumadefault.com to get my new book it's so good I can't wait, and that's coming out uh, (laughs) next month. So thank you so much, and and congratulations on all that you've accomplished. But thank you for being a woman of significance, because I know you've had the successes in life, but it's the significance that you're making now that is really, really important, and uh, your mother would be proud. So She is. Thanks, Debbie and Dr. Tim. Thank you so much, Debbie. I I always appreciate our journey, and I can't see what happens this year, next year, and um, and every year that we have an opportunity to just be able to impact uh, the world and each other. So thank you so much for what you do. You're welcome. Never a dull moment. So thank you, everybody, for listening to Stand Up and Speak Up. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self. And regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, This showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you as well by providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources so that no matter where you are in your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you are ready. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that, and we really appreciate you being here. If you or anyone that you know has been a victim to fraud or scam, report it to anyscam.com or ic3.gov. And remember to join our Facebook group, Stand Up and Speak Up, for special information and replays. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you know anybody struggling with neuropathy and the pins and needles and the numbness in their extremities, check out BenfoComplete.com and use the special code STANDUP for 5% discount. We thank everybody for being here. This is a copyrighted production and copyright to the woman behind the smile thank you christy thank you dr tim thank you listeners and have a wonderful day we'll be with you next week take care everybody thank (laughs) y'all